Sorry, Derek. I'm having a hard, <laughs> having a bit of a hard time getting myself under control because I'm, I'm looking at your scene right now, and I know that you've just moved and you're moving into a new place here. But you, you've got, you've moved into a basement and you've got your microphone, which is partially eaten. Yeah, dude. Hold up. Check this out. This is proof that the show must go on. I know, right? Yeah, we're savages. And right. also, if you look really closely, you can see my microwave right here. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Not yeah. quite set up yet. Okay. I wanted to talk about, before we got into today's topic, I wanted to talk about one of these stocks that is uh, probably the best performer on our tactical model in the past two to three weeks, and that's NVIDIA. Did you see that article I sent you about their supercomputer that they built called the Cambridge One? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, well, one, I'm not technical enough to know the intricacies of like what uh, is special about it. I just know it's a super fast computer that uses NVIDIA's chips, but it's a lot of, uh, they're using it for like biotech purposes. Isn't that the, the case? Yeah, biotech. I think they actually called it uh, digital biology or something like something, some phrase that I'd actually never heard before. But also with uh, the genome and, and some of the, the genetic testing that they're doing. Uh, suppose, supposedly, this computer is going to be, well, they said it's the fastest in the United Kingdom. And a lot of the drug companies are uh, putting a lot of money behind this computer. I think it was a $100 million computer, which they built. Jeez. But my reason for bringing that up, I'm like you, I, I can. I know enough to say that that's a pretty fast computer or it's a pretty expensive computer. But occasionally you have, uh, we talk about getting into these momentum swings. And if I look at a company like Nvi NVIDIA, you've been very bullish on NVIDIA for a long time. But it, to me, it seems like every news that comes out about NVIDIA right now is good news. Yeah. They've got, with their graphics processing units, they're in such high demand, they, they can't possibly produce uh, enough to keep up with the demand, which is a good thing as far as being able to uh, pricing power on your product that you're having. They're getting into CPUs in 2023 to compete against Intel. And now they're launching uh, the world's fastest computer in the United Kingdom. I think there's a lot to be excited about NVIDIA. And I think uh, I had, was having a conversation with my father-in-law a couple of days ago, and I was telling him about NVIDIA and how it was progressing uh, as a stock within his account. And he said, we were talking about it and he said, yeah, that's a stock that I've always wanted to get into, but I felt felt like I've missed a run. I think that's a stock that we're going to look back three, four, five years from now and say, man, remember when we could have picked NVIDIA up for 800 bucks a share? Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. And then just to uh, one extra note, like they can't produce enough to keep up with the demand and they're already at the luxury price point. Like they're actually more expensive at that price point for their consumer products than uh, their competitors and they're still selling out within seconds, 10 seconds. And then uh, also another thing to look forward to is that deal with Arm Holdings, which uh, to reiterate, they design 90% of the chips that are used in smartphones, and that includes Apple. So, I mean, it seems like the only place that they don't have exposure is in mobile phones. And then they're, ac or they're acquiring a company that designs 90% of those chips. And then uh, if we look at all of the the areas that they have exposure in autonomous driving, data center, uh, AI, cryptocurrency mining, those are all in the infancy stages of those uh, industries. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I completely agree. I think going forward, it's uh, it's building a stronger and stronger case to keep buying rather than, uh, I mean, you maybe can wait for a, a better entry point. I mean, I think it's up like 50% for the month. So maybe, <laughs> maybe a better entry point, but uh, definitely... Don't, I wouldn't like to take profits, and I'm not looking to take profits. I'm just right. looking to acquire more. Right. And also, as we've talked in previous podcasts, I think you want to keep in mind what your time horizon is. So if my time horizon for NVIDIA is 20 years from now, 15 years from now, obviously, I may not hold it that long because if something, especially with a technology company, technology can, can change and it could it could force companies to be uh, unprofitable as far as or unattractive uh, as far as the product they're making. But I foresee, at least in the next decade i foresee nvidia to be a powerhouse uh going forward so you're right, exactly right i would expect at any point in time with the run it's had to have a pullback right mm -hmm. uh and if that happens that might be a nice entry to pick it up and you might not feel as bad buying it at 800 and some dollars a share uh, but certainly a lot of exciting things going on you had mentioned some of the things that they're into all those that you just named are kind of like the um 
the hot topic issues, the autonomous driving, uh, the cryptocurrency, uh, all their chips that they've got, all that is kind of like the hot button or the hot topic issue here for investing. And you're getting to see a lot of money behind this. You had mentioned, you sent me a text the other, night, the other day, actually it was last night, on, is it crypto, crypto.com? Yeah, crypto.com signed a $175 million sponsorship deal with the UFC. If you watched the, the fight last night, uh, the fighter kits, like the, what they walked out in, they had crypto.com right here on the, the center of the chess piece. And then the mat, uh, one of the big sponsorships was crypto.com. It was on the the poles of the octagon like it, it's a it's a pretty big deal i, I also tweeted i said um the the sponsorship deal is not complete until you can buy the pay-per-view using bitcoin and then mm -hmm. i said just kidding because i'm not spending my bitcoin and i'm also not buying the pay-per-views <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that's true but the, the thing is, it's interesting to see that um, I don't know if Bitcoin is going to be here 15 years from now. I don't know what cryptocurrency is going to win, but I think the idea of cryptocurrency is here to stay. And there certainly is a lot of money uh, behind all this, uh, which leads me to, to believe, as, as actually taking your words, it's probably at this point more likely to be in existence 15 years from now than it is to be a dud. It's just, yeah, there's too much there's too much weight behind it. I mean, the entire crypto market has over a $1 trillion market cap. I mean, it's one trillion. I mean, in U.S. dollars, uh, that's a, that's a significant amount of weight to be behind one financial instrument. And think about it, like all the applications. All of the the smartest people in the room are bullish on it. I just read an article. Uh, Steve Wozniak, the co uh, co founder of Apple, he mm -hmm. was saying it was a, a mathematical marvel, and he's incredibly bullish on uh, Bitcoin in particular. I believe. Actually, I'm not going to say that. It might. He might have been bullish on Ethereum as well. So I, I, I would take that back. I'm not going to say that, but uh, maybe I'll post the article and uh, see what it, he, exactly his words were. Yeah. There's enough things going on with uh, companies. Kathy Wood's company, ARK Invest, just filed for a Bitcoin ETF. Am I correct with that? Yes. Yeah. And, and there's numerous ones, and you're seeing large banks getting into it. It seems like the institutional money is now lining up and doing all their filing, whatever they do, to to be into it. And I think if Bitcoin is going to, or cryptocurrency is going to be here to stay, and it's going to prosper, you need that institutional money in there. And of it, course, appear, yeah. it appears that it's more than on its way. I was listening to, this was when they did the the Bitcoin conference, uh, I think maybe that was last month. Maybe that was in May, maybe that was in June. But um, it was actually Kevin O'Leary, the the guy on Shark Tank, Mr. Wonderful. He was, um, he's pretty bullish on, well, he's very bullish on Bitcoin. And he was talking about the, the, pinch, the, the potential hurdles for institutional money because he runs a lot of ETFs. I think it's O'Leary ETFs. I think that's his company. And uh, he was talking about like the ESG concerns, and that's kind of what the big mm -hmm. hurdle was for Elon Musk. But he was investing in a lot of companies that could potentially be a solution to the ESG problems. That's environmental, social, governance. Governance, that, yep. yeah, yeah. governance. Basically, they, um, the environmental concern is that uh, people are mining cryptocurrency. They, it takes up a lot of uh, computational power, which is a lot of electrical power, which uses fossil fuels to mine. So the carbon footprint of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining is, um, I mean, if you look into it, it's it's a little bit more nuanced in the way like the power grids work and everything, the way it's explained. And a lot of it is um, just people choosing the, the cheapest power, which in some regions is clean energy. But um, I digress. Uh, but yeah, I think as far as, or once the ESG concerns are lifted, I think uh, a lot of institutional money will come pouring in. Yeah, it's definitely it's actually um, it's shocking when you when they show like the amount of energy used in these computers to mine cryptocurrencies. They actually uh, some claim that it exceeds the the power usage of some countries, entire countries. I also heard that um, the amount of power that are uh, used in Christmas lights in the month of December is more electricity than some countries. So that's kind of a that's probably a, true a bad metric. And, and probably me too, because I like the big old-fashioned giant bulbs that actually catch things on fire. That they've they outlawed. get super hot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those are mine. Oh yeah, nice. So let's get into today, to today's topic, and that is real return. Because as planners, as investors, when we get into something, uh, it's important to understand what we're actually getting after taxes are paid, after inflation is taken in, into consideration, what do we actually walk away with? Because not all investments are good long-term investments. 
and you typically see, so let me give you an example of this. And this really is a mindset type thing. If we're going to be a good long-term investor, I think we have to train ourselves to have the mindset of a long-term investor. And an example of not that is, so I've got a friend that works in a uh, bank, a popular bank. It's actually, uh, well, I won't name it, but it's a bank in our tactical model. I'll just say that. And he says he has people all the time come in there. And then, of course, the tellers are trained when they somebody comes up and they see, hey, you've got $300,000 sitting, sitting in a checking account earning 0.01%. They send him over to uh, to my friend who offers them the different products that they have that potentially have more interest. And he had said that right now uh, there he's selling a lot of annuities. And I looked at him and said, really? I was like, if you look at the annuities, they're paying like 1.5%, 2%. Like, how can you justify locking somebody up to a multi-year contract at 1.5 or 2%. He's like, you don't understand. They see that 1.5% and they're earning 0.01% in their checking account. And they think that's amazing. So they're, they're jumping into them. I mean, relatively, that is amazing. That's like an order of magnitude higher. or two, That'd be two orders of magnitude higher. Right. My friend gets it, though. He understands what he's doing. And he says, but you understand you're still losing money with this after taxes are paid and inflation. Considering if you look, go on to the Department of Labor, if you get on and look at the trailing 12 months of the CPI from May 2020 to May 2021, they listed at 5%. So think about that. You're, earning, you're locking your money up for three to five years and you're earning that 1.5. I, I understand uh, that it's quite a bit more than they were earning in the checking account. But his response to them is accurate. You are losing money. He shouldn't say that. You're not losing money. You're losing purchasing power. Sure. That, that's the correct word. You're losing purchasing power. And the response to him was, yeah, but it's only a little bit. And he, he like rubs his eyes. <laughs> so it's only a little bit. So if that if we have the, the consumer price index, if the tra trailing 12 months uh, is 5%, they list at 5% from May 2020 to May 2021. So that means if I have $100,000 sitting in that account, I've lost about $5,000 in purchasing power uh, from that time. But it's only a little bit. So not a big deal. The problem is, is it's a facade because you still see that $100,000 with those th one in those uh, five zeros after it. And you still think it's the same amount of money. It's the same the number of dollars in there, but the purchasing power has eroded. And then uh, we, we talked about this too. Well, one, we also predicted that um, like the Fed's mandate is to keep inflation between two and 3%. We both predicted that they wouldn't be able to keep that under under 5%. And it's, uh, it's at 5% just for the month of uh, was that this quarter or for this month? I was looking at the trailing 12 months. Oh, they have gotcha. it at 5%. Gotcha. So, yeah, I mean, but we called that. And then, uh, sorry, uh, I got sidetracked. What were you, what else did you say about that? I'm just saying, saying that, um, that, so that mindset, like they're only a, only a little bit. And, and I just had a, this is kind of all adding up to this this topic that we're talking about today. He told me that story. And then I recently had um, an email that I actually received two days ago. And it was for somebody who was looking to, they had sold a business, they had a significant amount of money, and they were looking to put it into something that was relatively conservative because they had uh, lost money in the 2008 downturn and they don't, didn't want to experience that again. So our short-term income uh, strategy is a perfect solution for that because uh, even though our short-term income strategy is not growing at the rate of inflation right now, but it's growing enough that, that it gives you a chance uh, there are some years that if you look back test that through 2008, there's some years where it did 6%. I think the average of that is right around 3%. So definitely going to trail it right now. Uh, but I offered that as a potential solution where minimal volatility and we we get, you know, three times 300% more than you're earning in a savings account. And then also our, our conservative strategy as well, which has uh, obviously more stock exposure. But I mean, that did 10% last year. And it's still uh, like even in its worst year, I think it lost less than 5%. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that could be a good solution as well. Yeah. I was trying to offer something to her that really would have hardly any volatility to it because uh, she was comparing it to annuities. And, of course, annuities aren't paying anything right now, bank CDs. And then she said, well, my accountant asked if you had a money market. And she she trusts her accountant for her, her a lot of her financial decisions, obviously. And then I, before I typed the email back to her, I thought, well, how do I, how do I, I even uh, – you know, approach this subject because here is her trusted advisor say, recommending a money market account to this. If you Google money markets right now, uh, some of the online ones that are a little bit, some of the high yield ones are 
uh, yielding about a half a percent right now. No chance at all uh, of keeping up with inflation. And the idea that we willingly take uh, these losses, these little bit losses, uh, as, the, as the person says, that add up over time. I mean, if you look back uh, from 2020 to, uh, I'm sorry, from 2000 to 2020, so a 20-year period, we talked about the Fed mandate of 2%. There are times like right now where they're not able to maintain that. But historically speaking, uh, they've been close. If, if we take an average over the, that 20-year period, it's about 2.25%, 2.23%. So just that 2.23% losing that every year eroding. Essentially, over that 20-year period, I would have lost over half of my, my purchasing power in my $100,000 if that was in my account. And so I understand that sometimes we have to be in, in cash strategies. We talk at Crosby Advisor, we talk about these emergency accounts, and we want to build uh, at least six months of usable, accessible income in something that's very, very safe. That doesn't necessarily mean it has to be cash, though. Uh, it might be in our short-term income strategy. Our operating money certainly is in cash. But we, ideally, we want to keep that cash exposure, if possible, at a minimum, because we want that. We don't want to just give that away to inflation uh, just to, and, and, I guess, capitulate and surrender to it. Yeah. And this, um, so I can kind of speak from the perspective, like trying to accumulate uh, assets and not so much with as a asset preservation, so like I have a much longer investment uh, time period, so I can take on a little bit more risk. But I, I for people my age, I would say like um, just keeping money in a savings account isn't the smartest thing to do right now. In fact, it's uh, probably not smart at all to do that because it's. Uh, I I think I mentioned this in another episode where it's like kind of the lamest way to lose money, where it's like it's a guaranteed way that you, it's just going to get your purchasing power is just going to get siphoned off. And it's like another like really boring way to lose money is like buying high, selling low, where it's just you're impatient with gains. It's like there's um, like long term investing is almost a sure proof, surefire way to make money over like a 20 year period. I think they say like 98 percent of investors make money like they don't lose money at, at that time frame. So, um, yeah, just kind of speaking for somebody my age group. Uh, I'm just saying going forward for this podcast, I probably can speak better to accumulating assets, but maybe my perspective isn't as valuable with uh, asset preservation. Well, you can preserve assets in the way that we can be, you know, there's a fine line there because obviously we do, uh, we want to preserve, you know, a certain period of time of assets. And, and depending who you listen to, you know, one of the things I look at is, so from 2000, if you look at any uh, history of time with the market, it's about a four to five year period of time that was the worst, that the, it was the longest point in time from when the market went down and it did not recover. So depending on the assets that you were able to accu accumulate, if you wanted to be very, very conservative, you could put that amount of money away in something that is going to be relatively safe. Putting it away in cash probably would not be the answer, but you could put it into something like our short-term income strategy, or you could put it into investment-grade bonds or, or something that, that historically has held its ground for a period of time. But there's that uh, that line there that you that I think you crossed where you're too conservative and eventually you've accepted the surefire loss where eventually you're going to run out of income uh, because the, the dollar that you have in your safe, if it's sitting there, it's just it's losing its purchasing, purchasing power too much, as I said, over a 20 year period. Uh, and you can go on to the U.S. Um, Labor Department website and they have an inflation calculator and you can punch that in there. It's actually really helpful. I went in and I hand checked it. Uh, I know not everybody's watching video here, but I actually, my camera's not going to show it. I actually went through and I hand checked all the years myself and I did the hand calculations on it because I wanted to see how accurate it was and it, it is accurate. Uh, but if you're willing to, yeah, go give half of your money, half of your purchasing power over that 20 year period of time, I don't know what a solution is for you. Sure. Yeah. And it's, and it's, uh, a, it's not a unique problem that people are having right now. Like I've read articles where like, uh, credit card debt is at a low because I mean, just this past year, um, with stimulus checks and like, uh, just all uh, pe people just not spending money. People are flush with cash for like the first time in a long time, but at the same time it's losing purchasing power and everybody can see that. I mean, look at the price of gas, look at the price of groceries, uh, look at all these shortages. It's all those things correspond to higher prices and, uh, everybody's having this problem, which I mean, uh, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but how much, uh, our, our short-term income fund is, uh, in high demand right now because 
a lot of people are having this problem. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day where they had uh, they had just sold a house and they sold it at a good time because like the housing market's going really well right now. So they would sell it and then th- now they're just sitting on a mountain of cash and nobody really knows what to do with it because there's not really a safe place to put cash because um, like look at fix- fixed income, look at long-term bonds, look at uh, medium duration. I mean, the only good place to put cash right now is equities or ultra short-term bonds. But if you do equities, it's like you're taking on a certain amount of risk and you don't want to necessarily take on that risk. So it's, right. it's pretty tricky where, uh, but you also don't want to do a money market when inflation's at 5%. Yeah, I was looking at so I was looking at if we're talking about real return, and I was kind of looking at different asset classes. Be, by the way, before I get into that, so your friend uh, sold their house and they sold it at a good point. What do they do as far as their current living situation? Did they, are they buying renting. another house? They're renting. renting. Yeah. Well, they're looking it's, to move. Yeah. Yeah. So that's for I mean that's a trick. A lot of they're, they're the problem a lot of people having in the current housing market is yeah they can sell their house for you know a lot higher, but then they also have to buy something that is a lot higher and. That always seems to be relative. If housing prices are down, uh, the some the uh, thing that you're buying is down as well. So it tends to be a relative problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, my parents are building, and they kind of like, I don't know. It was just everything lined up nice for them because they signed all the contracts and stuff before this crazy takeoff in uh, housing prices. So they sold at the perfect time, and then they also uh, built before the increase in lumber and like all that other stuff. So they kind of made out like bandits. Oh, yeah. I'm learning that firsthand. So we're redoing our, our, our kitchen and we're putting a deck on. And the kitchen cabinets are a 14, 14 week delay as far Ching. as yeah, <laughs> being able to for me to order them and get them in and then trying to line up a contractor to correspond with that is uh, is all but a nightmare. Yeah. So but I got some good guys. Shout out to Newsome Painting and Remodeling. Uh, also Denman Construction. Denman, uh, Keith Denman helped me with the uh, the layout of my deck in the in kitchen, and he did a, an amazing job. He's out of uh, Cortland, Ohio. So if you were building something, he's the guy for sure. Shout out! I'll drop the uh, I'll drop the the Google of my business. <laughs> yeah, perfect. He's a great guy too. I went to college with him. But I was looking uh, at the real return of some of the asset classes. Uh, obviously, we just talked about cash is the surest loser. Like you're signing up, I'm losing to inflation. There was actually one year in the past twenty years where inflation was. Uh, it was not was negative, I should say, in 2000. What was it? 2018, 2017. Yeah, not that it matters here, but uh, 2009, actually, uh, inflation was uh, negative. But most years, infl- inflation is eating away at our, at our dollar. Uh, so cash is the surest loser. CDs, same thing. If you take into consideration that most CDs are held outside of an IRA. So if I earn my 1.5% in my CD, I'm paying tax on that after I pay the tax on it, it's surely going to lose out to inflation. Now, this doesn't mean that you should never be into something like that. If I'm going to buy a house in six months, there's nothing wrong with putting money in a three month CD. Sure. But uh, for this podcast, obviously, we're talking long term and and long term is up up to you. But I'm looking probably at things of uh, if I'm holding my money for a, a year or longer, I'm probably putting cash that is not in my operating expense I'm putting into something that at least has the ability to earn and keep up with uh, inflation. Especially when you see like, uh, like the bull market and equities, like, I mean, all of our tactical model stocks have kind of, well, they kind of lagged in March, but now they're, I mean, most of our names, we rebalance our models and uh, it looks rosy, at least for the, like a few months time frame for a lot of our tactical model names. Yeah, and they, and they can pull back at any point in time. I mean, that's the nature sure, of yeah. equities. Yeah. I always tell people that that's why we talk about, you know, for long-term investors, we should plan on holding stocks for a, a three- and five-year period or, or longer. And that's the minimum that I would get into stocks. Um, having access to that accessible money, if I had six months of income, I'm not really worried about what my stocks are doing. And I think that's an, uh, another point to make as far as how you uh, change your mindset. So, if I was a risk adverse person, and there's nothing wrong to being risk adverse, but I, I don't want to take all of my money, all my savings, and put it into something that's going to lose to inflation. If I could keep six months of uh, income in something that I could get to, or 12 months of income, if you wanted to be even even more conservative on that, then that would free up permission to take the red, the balance of that and put it into something that has a chance to outpace inflation so that I have an increasing income. And as stocks do their thing and they, they ebb and flow, and, and even if they pull back, I shouldn't panic if I've got six to 12 months of accessible cash ahead of me. Uh, but the one thing that I looked at, so 
Cash uh, is a sure term, sure loser. CDs have been a sure loser uh, for the most part. Uh, fixed income is a sure long term loser. Uh, real estate surprised me. So, I, real estate had a, had, a, had a very nice run, and especially since the 2008 uh, recession. But if I look at uh, real estate, and I use the VNQ, which is a popular real estate e ETF, past five years it's up 16%. Well, if you take into consideration taxes paid on those dividends, and if you take into consideration inflation, real estate at best has kept pace with inflation over that period of time. So, yeah, I mean, but that's uh, REITs. That's not necessarily like owning rental properties. That's owning rent, rental properties. But what you're not what you're getting from the REITs is you're not. Uh, you know, if you look at a rental property, you've got the taxes that you're paying on it, that you're paying uh, constantly. You've got the upkeep, the insurance. I'm not saying that there's no there's no uh, profit there. But looking at the real return, I think that you'll probably find with most rental properties, you're probably keeping pace with inflation unless you have a a multi, you know, 20 unit apartment building that you can scale. Sure. Uh, gold uh, in the past five years has actually been a, a very nice invested up about 30% in the past five years. But historically speaking, keeps pace with inflation. Really, the only um, only investments historically that have been proven to be ahead of inflation, uh, I would say is a number of things. Number one, stocks. Stocks have kept ahead of inflation. Al there are alternative investments that have kept ahead of inflation. Uh, in most recent times, you could argue Bitcoin has been a fantastic investment for keeping ahead of inflation. Depends on what year you pick. <laughs> Depends on what year you pick. I I'm talking probably the past uh, decade. Sure. If we looked at the past decade of of those. And the other one I would probably say would be an investment in yourself. Oh, yeah, your, your, yeah. your ability to earn income yourself and increase your income through your knowledge and expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's that's like uh, you obviously can't like quantify that. And you can't track it. Well, I mean, if you use income as a proxy for that, but um, I mean, you could also use like happiness, overall happiness, or uh, yeah, I mean, just how well your life's put together. You could use that, but it's it's harder to quantify, so that kind of gets swept under the rug sometimes. So I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a good example. I would probably say that it was a great answer for somebody who, no matter how they look at this, and no matter how which we coach them and how we put these. Um, these assets together and even if we give them 12 months of accessible cash the idea of taking some of their money and put it into something that is in a variable investment has a potential to lose money if that makes them lose sleep at night i would say then take the money and put it in yourself mm. go get an education go learn a skill learn something that allows you to make more money with your job sure speaking of which are you reading any books right now i'm still reading the fountainhead that's a uh, like that's, a 40, that's 40 hour yeah. book yeah that's long yeah yeah i'm on uh well like I'm reading, physically reading The Queen's Gambit still. It's not very long. I just have been all over the place and I have kind of dropped the ball. And then I just bought uh, Malcolm Gladwell's new book, The Bomber Mafia, because I'm a big fan of his. Which, what, what is that one about? Uh, I think it's about, well, so he did Talking with Strangers and that was like specifically for audiobook. I think he released it on like paperback, hardback, but it was for um, audiobook. Like he used audio from videos or whatever but this one i think is the same format where he uses like transcripts and stuff like that so it's structured for audiobook but i think it's it's about world war ii sorry to answer your question no that's good that's okay <laughs> so talking to strangers which reminded me of there's a book that was um larry king wrote a book that was called how to talk to anybody anytime anywhere and uh so people probably pick this up from this podcast i have a problem with talking too fast and sometimes I have to really slow myself down. And when I was uh, growing up out of college, I had a, uh, I don't know if it was a speech impediment, but I, I stuttered quite a bit. I had trouble getting out what I wanted to say. I was terrified to speak in uh, public. I was probably the most frightening class I ever, I ever took in college was a public speaking class. And so purposely to cure Not myself. organic chemistry? <laughs> no, I, organic chemistry, I, I, uh, I passed. It was the it was the physics that I would walk out of that classroom with literally migraine headaches, but uh, so I purposely took a sales job out of out of uh, out of college. I was working for um, a fastener company, Challenge Fasteners, in, in Nashville, Ohio, and I took that job because I wanted to make sure that I was in front of people and, and talking to people. And I would do things like traveling down the road. I know we're way off topic here. Traveling down the road, I would see signs and I would enunciate the signs. That's how bad it was. I would enunciate the signs out loud so that I could practice that speech. And uh, one of the other sales guys that was at that office, on my uh, the uh, lunch break, 
he found my lunch pail and he found that book that was in there. And so we were going on a sales call together and it was the three of us and we were sitting in this office and it was me, the other sales guy and the, and the purchasing manager. And the other sales guy was kind of sitting behind the purchasing managers as I was talking. And as I was talking, he pulled out the book, How to Talk to Anybody, Anytime, Anywhere. <laughs> and it's kind of like your microphone here. When we started off, I just, I lost it. That's funny. We're off topic with that. You're booking. Well, I mean, not really, because that. that would definitely be considered an investment in yourself that paid off. Because, I mean, I've only known you for like maybe two years now, and I, I, I never knew that. So, I mean, yeah. clearly that was an investment that, in yourself that uh, kept pace with inflation, if not beat inflation. For sure, for sure. Yeah. And I think that's the thing to do is, um, so Macy, I don't know where, where this came from. I'm going to credit Macy from our office because uh, she heard it from somewhere. I know that. She told me that. But she, uh, she had this um, saying that she would... Uh, often bring up and she would say choose your heart and what, what she meant by that have you ever heard that before yeah 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 okay well basically you've got it's going to be hard either way either you're going to have a hard time making income and you're going to live you know paycheck to paycheck and life is going to be hard or you can choose to do something hard learn a skill and use that skill to provide value to others which allows you to have an income that makes a comfortable life sure yeah yeah i love that and i i'd sort of live by that i think i think that's good at good motto if you live by mottos but um i always uh relate it to like the gym where i think this is actually uh joe rogan that says this but he says um like uh if you're stressed or if you have uh yeah i think the main one he uses is stress it's like you can like torture yourself in your head where you can be uh have high levels of anxiety or you can like choose to do a really hard workout and kind of alleviate your demons and it's like both of those things are hard, but you get to choose uh, what, because he if he doesn't work out, then he uh, like he, his head goes crazy or whatever. I think that's how he stated it. But, yeah, I think that's really good. Yeah. So I think the moral of this, um, I guess the, not the moral, but what we take away from this podcast is the, the question that I would ask when I got into investment, you, you want to ask what your real return is after everything's all said and done. After taxes are paid, uh, after we take inflation, inflation into consideration, if there's any fees involved into it, what are you actually walking away with it? Because I think we want to be very careful how long we keep our money in instruments that are not significantly beating inflation in the long term. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about was um, like when you throw advisor fees into it, because I have uh, I have beef with target date funds. <laughs> I just think they're... Uh, well, I, I mean, they're not bad long-term investments. You'll still, I mean, they still average close to double-digit returns. Notice I said close to double-digit returns. I pulled up the um, the Vanguard 2040 target date funds, and it trails the market with comparable levels of volatility. And then, uh, like on Morningstar, you can kind of crack them open and see what's in them. And so, I mean, uh, the saving grace is that they're actually pretty low fees, so um, the funds that are within the target date fund are like total stock market ETFs, uh, total bond market ETFs, total institution or uh, international. So, I mean, it's like 50 percent the total stock market ETF. So if they were charging high fees, it definitely wouldn't be worth it. So this is Vanguard. So they're notorious for charging low fees. Mm -hmm. um, but like the weights in here are nothing to like, it doesn't take Warren Buffett to come up with these weights. It's a typical 80, 20 portfolio. But what drives me crazy is like. Some of the 401k plans that we see or uh, some of the portfolios we see, uh, the advisors will be charging a 1% fee on top of a, a target date fund. So the target date funds themselves, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to build them. And it definitely right. doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, oh, what year do you want to retire? 2040? Okay, here's here's that. And then they charge you 1%. They charge you more than I'll the people that are years. building it. <laughs> yeah. It drives me crazy. Yeah. So, sorry, just to bring in real return. So uh, it said that the the 2040 Vanguard fund returned, um, sorry, returned 7.73% before inflation over a 14 year average, 7.73% over 14 years, and then adjusted for inflation, that's 5.61%. And I mean, going back to what I said, like starting from a position where you're looking to accumulate assets, that just doesn't seem like it's a viable option for somebody like me. You know what I'm saying? No, and I will admit that sometimes I'm hypocritical about this because, um, so we service 401k plans, Derek. And the, the thing about a 401k plan that um, is good and bad is, for those of you who don't know, if you if you participate in a 401k plan, those offerings 
uh, that are brought to you are essentially offerings that um, the the third party administrator who is administering this uh, 401k has a fiduciary duty to offer uh, anywhere from 18 to 25 options that are are, are high, supposedly high quality funds and it's kind of kind of mirror either benchmarks or they're, they're designed to keep up with benchmarks, whether that benchmark is a bond fund or an S&P 500, or they could be a portfolio like like an 80-20 portfolio. So it's designed to meet a portfolio that is 80% stocks and, and 20% bonds. And I see people in those target date funds. And it's people, a lot of the people that are in those target date funds are people who have no experience with investing and they have zero, uh, I, zero interest in learning about investing. Mm-hmm. And so I show them, I sit down, I'll show them, look, here's a target date fund. Here's your Vanguard target date fund that has 80% stocks and 20% bonds. If we build that same thing ourselves using, you know, using the NASDAQ, using the S&P 500, using uh, the Vanguard's total bond market, if we build that ourselves, we beat the return pretty significantly. Right. But it's still glossy eyes. They, they're pointing at the target date fund because it's set and forget, right? Yeah. And, and so in that instance... Even though like all all the the air just left my lungs because a two percent difference over over decades is a huge difference. The fact that they're still investing puts puts them ahead. As long as they're investing in something, yeah, yeah, it's not the best option, um, but it's certainly better than taking money and putting it in cash. Right. So yeah, I mean, adjusted for inflation, I said it was like five per, or five point five percent, and then like if you took an advisor fee from that of one percent, then it would be. Uh, like, I mean, we just said that inflation's at 5% right now, and that would be closer to 4%. So I, I see what you're saying. But, uh, like, I guess coming from a position, uh, coming from a position of somebody who, uh, like, is okay with a little bit more uh, risk, I would just say do the S&P because you're getting uh, more weights in, like, high-quality companies that we would look to invest in. Yeah. But and, and that's still a set it and forget it. So I, I don't know. I would probably advise uh, like just the S&P. In a perfect world, I would say do the NASDAQ. But, uh, sure, yeah. But that's <laughs> typically not offered in, in the 401k offerings. But no, I, I mean, you're right on the money uh, with that. It's, I mean, it's the, the thing that, that I try to uh, get into these people is, I say these people, people who are not interested in, in money or investing, right? Mm-hmm is you kind of have to be because because money you have to force yourself to be there's a lot of things in life that, that I don't want to do um, you know I'd rather eat pizza every night than um, something that's healthy but there's some some things in life that you just have to do because it leads to a, a happier fuller life and mastery over your money is one of them I, I think we need to learn that and that doesn't um, mean that we have to be able to all of us be able to value a stock but I think you have to be able to see that are certain investments long term are more advantageous than others and the putting a little bit of effort into that into learning that and understanding why things um why things are where they are and, and the fees that we're paying the taxes that we're going to pay uh, how inflation affects all that i think it's going to be worth uh a lot uh, a great deal later on when we're actually spending that money i completely agree yeah so where do we leave off here what's the answer derek as far as is there an answer to the, some people maybe that are, are uh, risk risk adverse or people who are looking to put money into something that can grow but maybe not um, not have the full ex- exposure of the market? Is there an answer to that? I mean, not to not to plug Crosby Advisory Group, but I think our short term uh, and again this is on a a shorter investment horizon. I think on a longer term investment horizon, uh, you should be fine to take on more volatility with maybe a more aggressive portfolio but if on a shorter time horizon like you need access to the money within with inside of five years i think our short-term income fund is uh does a stellar job and uh we've seen a, a, a lot of demand for it because like i said earlier a lot of people are having a similar problem when we started that i i I kind of hinted to you that I think we're going to see a big demand of this as banks pay 0.01%. I think you're going to have people and businesses who say, hey, I've got cash on the side. I may need it at any moment, but I, I can't stand to see my bank pay me a couple of dollars a month in order to keep you know all this money in there. Right. Yeah. So, well, Derek, I think um, I'm, in, I'm going to end with this. Thing, and I, I actually read this on a book that was called, uh, I think it was called Next Level Investing. I'll see if I can find out for the next podcast, find out the actual title. But 
there was a statement in there, uh, as I've said on previous podcasts, sometimes I read a book. And if I can take one thing away from that book and add that to my life, to me, that book was a, a success. And what I got from that book was the author of that book said that you need to define what risk is. And he said, in my mind, risk is not the day to day fluctuation of assets. The risk is ending up where I want to be and not having enough money. Mm. So I think if we can take that mindset with our investments and realize that if we can be in quality investments, yes, we've got different buckets of money. We've got emergency money. We've got money that's kind of intermediate money. Our long-term money that we don't plan for touching for decades, as you just said, I think we can open that up and expose that to a little bit of price movement uh, for an opportunity to outpace inflation into the future. I love a a Warren Buffett quote. It's um, diversification is a hedge against ignorance where – like the less volatility you're willing to take on is usually a proxy for how um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say ignorant, but like novice you are at investing because um, like somebody that can look at long term, like 20 year. Uh, sorry, I lost I lost you again, but I'll just keep going. <laughs> uh, they can look at the past 20 years of the S&P 500 and see that it it's a clear line upwards and to the right. Um, and they're more comfortable sleeping at night when their portfolio drops 10% or it goes through what we just went through with COVID or, I mean, fill in the blank with any of the big market corrections. But yeah. yeah. Sorry, I and I, I, I would say, I would say that ignorance is, um, when you're talking about ignorance, I don't think you necessarily meant that in a bad, bad way. Like saying you're, no. ignorance just meaning a lack of knowledge, right? Right. So, and you could say that about it. It has anything, a right? negative connotation though. Which it does have a negative here. connotation to it, but the lack of knowledge, and, and you can even say us as we do this for a living, there are some things about companies that we just don't know and we can't know because we're not in there, in there running the companies. Sure. So be, because of that, that, because of that ignorance, it does make sense to diversify. I mean, even uh, like if we get a tip on like a biotech stock, we're not immediately going to go all in on it because we don't know. It's like that. And like we would diversify maybe if we're interested in the space by the ETF. So like diversification is still um, like a hedge against our ignorance in biotech, for example. Perfect. Yep. I agree. Well, Derek, anything else to add before we head out into the week? Uh, As always. Well, first off, hopefully by next week I get (laughs) a new mic cover. We're going to order you one on Amazon for sure. (laughs) Yeah. but as always, thank you guys for listening to Dynamic Growth. If you like the podcast, uh, like, share, and subscribe on um, or wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Instagram at Dynamic Growth Pod and at Crosby Advisory Group. Follow us on YouTube and subscribe at Crosby Advisory. And we'll see you guys next week. Keep in mind, Crosby Advisory is a registered investment advisor in the state of Ohio and Florida. And at any time, you can request our forms ADV 2A and 2B, which go into the business practices and qualifications of Crosby Advisory. Today on this show, Derek and I mentioned specific securities. That's not a recommendation for you to go out and buy them, sell them. Please do your own homework. Understand that investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. And you should carefully consider all risks and fees before making an investment. Crosby Advisory is also a licensed insurance advisor. Check out Julie and Macy's videos on Instagram. They do a nice job on that. They do a great job on educating our clients and our friends on insurance products. So we are an insurance advisor. Insurance products are sold and serviced through Crosby Advisory. 